We have, uh, we have a distinguished panel today of uh, yacht finance banks who are not listening. I, Thank you. I just was looking at my picture, so... I'll... I was going to make a joke about diversity at this point because I was going to say that we've, apart from uh, Jim, we've got people only with a surname beginning with a B, uh, which shows a very narrow choice of speakers, but I thought that's such a bad joke, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't actually give it to you, so anyway. Right, quick introduction. Um, from the far end, um, we have uh, Michel, um, we have, um, sorry, uh, uh, we have Olivier Blanchet. Uh, Olivier is head of the Jet and Yacht um, team at BNP Paribas, and um, he's, uh, I think he set up, when did you set up, 2005, something like that, the, uh, yeah. the, the team? Uh, then we have uh, Andy Blundell, from, uh, director at Close, uh, and Andy's got 30 years' experience in, in asset finance, uh, jet uh, and yachts. Jim Simpson um, is our North American representative, based in San Francisco, um, and uh, heads up the jet and, and yacht um, offering for First Republic Bank. And then finally, closest to me, Michel Buffat, uh, Credit Suisse, also um, running a jet and, y and yacht team since 2005, focusing on ultra high net worth clients. So wel welcome, gentlemen. Um, first question that we were given to look at, do private banks have to offer yacht finance? It's have to offer, it sounds like it's a, it's a sort of requirement. Um, I suppose the, the, the question then is, you know, if you are a private bank and, you, and you're, you're targeting wealthy individuals and the wealthy individuals want a yacht loan, um, can you turn them away? And what happens if you do? Michel, do you want to start off with that one? I mean, first, I would, of course, would not want to talk other banks into the business because I think uh, it's we're enough, we're happy. But no, besides that, uh, it, it's... Uh, it's really clear, uh, in, in our view and in our assessment, uh, having a yacht financing offering is, is just something essential, because as you correctly mentioned, our, our target client, the segment we want to be in, is the ultra high net worth segment, and their yachts are definitely a topic, and being able to also offer yacht financing is, is, is very important for us, uh, because anything that you cannot offer to a client might bring him to talk to another bank, which you, of course, would not want to. You would like to have the full range of products. So in our view, it's a clear statement. Yes, we want to have it, and we think we, we, we need to have it. Olivier? Um, so if you, if you look at the scope of uh, the private banks, uh, actually there are very few able to, to lend money against, uh, against the yachts. That is to say that it's not necessary to have this type of product to be, uh, to be a private bank. Uh, a lot of private banks uh, don't have this product and uh, they are going very well. Uh, having said that, as uh, Michel said, it's uh, a fantastic product in terms of door opener and to develop a private banking uh, relationship with uh, ultra high net worth individuals, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and welcome Anthony Runetta to, to the panel, who's just landed, so um, well done Anthony. Uh, head of Jet and Yacht Finance at, at SOCGEN. Um, thoughts on, on whether private banks should, should do, do yacht lending or not do yacht lending? Um. <coughs> Um, I think that uh, Olivier and Michel have, have uh, well covered the, the question is basically um, uh, when, you want to, when you want to work with ultra high net worth individuals, you have to be able to assist them in, in any kind of project they have. So the idea is, of course, uh, not to finance any yachts, but uh, I think this is not, not the case of all of us here today, uh, but uh, be able also to, um, to uh, uh, provide a solution um, 
which also is, is in the interest of the clients, because at the end of the day, uh, we are private banks, so we are interested into wealth management, wealth planning. Uh, so yacht finance is just one of the tools that we are using. But as said, Olivier, it's also um, a, a magnificent uh, door opener. I mean, it's something that we can use to, to also attract and gain new clients in, uh, in this specific area of private banking. And, and Jim, from the, from the US perspective, um, is it regarded as risky lending? It's a different risk of lending. Um, to answer your question, do private banks have to do this? No, but if they don't, they're gonna lose a segment because the, the marine and the aviation financing are very sticky products. You do a seven to 10 year deal with an owner and you've taken care of a boat, which is hard. They say, wow, what else can you do for us? So it gets you into it. So from a risk perspective, um, Boats and airplanes are very different. A, a, a Gulfstream G550, I can tell you exactly what it is, how many have been built, where they are, and who's going to buy them, okay? A boat is a very different animal, and no two are alike, and it's really subject to personal taste, and if you ever have to take one back, it's a very different world, because you've got to keep it crewed to keep it insured to where you're going to keep it and how long it's going to take to sell it. So yeah, it's a different risk profile, but we study it, we're students of it, um, and we like it. Andy? I, I come from a similar perspective to Jim in that Close Brothers is an asset-led lender as opposed to a whole wealth management offering. Um, I perhaps would just turn the question around slightly. I think the industry needs big wealth banks to provide yacht financing because, because the projects are very complex, they are very large sums of money, they tend to have um, quite flexible timings between when it starts, when it's supposed to finish, when it actually finishes. There's lots of construction risk involved. Um, not a lot of banks will want to do that. So what I think you need to have the real in-depth relationship with your client to be able to offer it at the, at the very highest level. So if you're looking at a brand new build, which will take two or three years or whatever, you actually need a wider relationship than just a pure asset-led deal. So, and, and I think without the offering of that finance by other banks, then the industry would probably be smaller because there would be less done. And Jim, you, you were saying earlier that you turned down a lot of requests for your finance. Yeah, well, we get approached with 35 deals or so every year and probably do 10. Um, a lot of it has to come to, if it's a new build, which shipyard is building it, we really try and stay with the, the higher end yards. Um, as you probably all know, there's a number of manufacturers and builders of boats over 140 feet. And you've got to be careful which ones you go after because you think about future values. Um, so, it, we, again, we look at it, we're students of it, we research it, uh, and we pick the ones we want to go after. And Anthony, how risky is, is your finance compared to other forms of, of lending, would you say? Um, I mean, funnily, I would say that, um, you know, sometimes it's, um, it's less risky because... Um, when we look at uh, the approach we have with yacht finance, the fact to be selective, the fact to go really deep into the analysis of the, 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 the client's wealth, the client revenues, the fact to, to take care of the, of the boat, as, as Jim just underlined, I mean, we have a really close follow-up. It's really different when you do finance real estate assets. When you do finance real estate assets, you start, you start on day one and, you know, most of the time you have uh, a survey which is being done every three years, four years, five years, it depends, uh, it depends on the bank policy. But uh, the guy can, the owner can, can just destroy the, the property and you come back and there's nothing on the land, uh, which cannot happen with the yacht because if anything happens with the yacht, you will be the, the first informed. So I have to say that indeed, um, having a default on a yacht is something which from a, from a capital point of view and from a regulation point of view is is, is not really good, is, is something which is a lot more uh, risky and, and consuming that uh, lending on real estate or any other uh, more liquid assets. But because of the attention and the care of uh, uh, the bank who are acting in this, in this specific industry, um, my, my point of view is that yeah, it's slightly less risky than making a lot of volume on, on liquid assets. Uh, on Olivier, I mean, presumably you've got a personal guarantee from a, from a, a high net worth individual. You don't need to worry about anything else, do you? Yeah, but all the lawyers in this room know perfectly that a personal guarantee is is a very difficult animal to 
to call. It's definitely a piece of your security package to negotiate uh, something. Uh, but to be honest, uh, we have uh, a personal guarantee for a very simple reason, because we finance a negative cash flow assets. So if our own client doesn't trust in his own repass, uh, recapacity to, to, to repay us, then we have an issue. But that's not, it's not because we have a personal guarantee uh, that we are ready to, to, to provide some money. So coming back to asset finance and your initial question, is it a risky uh, asset? I tend to believe that from a client and bank perspective, uh, it is definitely the most risky uh, asset you can find uh, compared to uh, jets or real estate. That's no doubt on that. Why? For very simple reason, because you uh, finance a depreciating asset, point number one. It's a very technical, uh, technical asset, so it has to be very well maintained. Uh, we know all the regulations around and uh, uh, something can, can happen. If you start to discuss with uh, the, insurance, the insurance broker, they will say now that it's more and more difficult to insure a yacht. Why? So that's something that, that we need to take into consideration. And more importantly, if you are, if you are um, invested with the client to finance the building process, you have also to take into account the performance risk on the shipyard side. So it is a complex uh, transaction and much more risky than real estate and, uh, and, and private jet from, uh, from my, yeah. uh, my perspective. Maybe just to add on, I, I fully agree with your assessment. In principle, it's a very risky asset if, if you don't do the deal properly. And of course, then as a bank, you, you look for mitigators of this additional risk. It's not a yeah, it's really not a liquid asset. You you know, if you have a, a loan against shares, you just you sell them the next day or the next minute, and then the, the problem is solved. With a yacht, we all know we cannot do that. So okay, so what we do, we have lower loan to values. We we request maybe more guarantees. We 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 we're closer to the asset. We want to have more information on the status of the of the yacht, etc. So. Overall, then, the risk is perfectly mitigated and it's not riskier than, than other, other products. But of course, we cannot go as far as when you lend against property in a top location in London, there is, the risk is, is, is much less, so you can do more. But overall, then, with the mitigators, which is then sometimes what, what, what clients don't really understand. They, they're not happy with our, uh, you know, the, the lower values or the you know, the shorter lending terms that we offer, but this is how we can make this product possible. And Jim, this is, this is relationship lending, so you, you're, you're keeping, presumably keeping a close eye on the stock exchange to see how the, the client's uh, net worth is going. Yeah, I mean, when you lend into a boat like this for seven to 10 years, you effectively become a partner with the owner. And you've got to stick, stay close to it, and you've got to look at their whole financial picture. In the US, we have, uh, a lot of real estate developers and real estate holders who are our clients. And they don't like to keep liquidity, they want to buy more real estate because that's how they're going to make their money. Uh, and so we put liquidity requirements on with the client to make sure that in an economic downturn they have the cash flow or the cash available to pay the bills for a while until they can work themselves out of situations. A lot of these people we talk about, well, you know, why do you want to finance a boat? And, or they say, I'm not going to finance a boat, I'll pay cash. And I'm like, what you should really think about in both the aviation and marine industries is these are depreciating assets. They go down in value and they cost a lot to operate and hold. Put your money in cash into things that go up in value, which in the US marketplace in this economic cycle has been real estate. Now that may change, but we manage the, the, the amortization of the loans to match the values of, of the assets. And that's where the, the luck, the skill, and being a student of it, that's where you sit, and that's what you look at. So, and, the, and when the equity markets wobble, and we were talking about this before, we are much more accepting of volatility today than we were 15 years ago. I remember in, uh, what, 2000, whatever, when the stock market dropped 1,000 points one day and everything sort of stopped, right? Now it wiggles 500 points, and everyone goes, eh, it'll come back, you know? I mean, you look at Tesla trading at $800 a share and you go, why? They don't make money. 
but that's what the markets do. So my business is very much tied to when the equity markets are good, people are buying and they want new things. When they really drop, that's when everyone pauses and says, I'm just going to wait a while to see how things work. I need to pick up some of the questions before we get complaints from the audience. So, uh, Andy, the, what yacht financing is available for non-UK buyers for loans in the range of 3 to 15 million euros? I guess it depends who they are, where they are, what they're buying. Typical banker's answer, but I mean, there, are, you know, there are various options. There's a good representation here, both in Europe and on, on, uh, in North America. It, um, our our specialisation is a more UK focus, but there are other banks clearly that are available to offer it. And so there is, um, there's probably more finance available than a lot of people <laughs> realise. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not something that everyone will do. But that, that's, I mean, for us, a three to 15 million range is a very nice deal. You know, so we are very happy to trade at that level. Um, but you know, we do have our own restrictions on where we can lend. Okay, so whoever asks the question, have a word with Andy afterwards and he'll, uh, he'll sort your deal. Um, we've got a couple of questions on the Poseidon principles and I know that at least three of our panelists uh, are signed up, fully paid up members to the Poseidon principles. I'm looking at, at Michel and uh, Anthony and Olivier, perhaps Olivier. Um, um, obviously these are ship finance uh, principles which uh, 11 banks are signed up to, you, you, you've uh, committed to certain principles on sustainability and, and uh, looking at uh, carbon emissions. So how's that uh, affecting your day-to-day your -day business? I don't know if it's, uh, it is affecting our, uh, our business. I tend to believe that it is an opportunity for uh, everybody in uh, in, uh, in the room include, uh, include ourselves. Um, so the Poseidon principle, maybe, I don't know if uh, everybody uh, is familiar with the Poseidon principle. So, so to make the long story short, uh, um, the key shipping banks decided to, to, to sign uh, this agreement stating that the bank uh, must play uh, a role in achieving um, in in achieving the challenge uh, related to the climate risk. So the maritime industry uh, took a commitment by reducing by 50 percent the greenhouse uh, gas emission by 50 percent um, before 2050. So it's a long time, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's very, very short. And, uh, and definitively, the yachting industry, which is from a client and public perspective, is definitely at the top of the iceberg of the maritime industry, because shipping vessels are invisible for everybody. Meanwhile, the yachting, the yachts, are visible by everybody in all the marinas in all over the world. So for us, it's a key uh, element to invite all the, the actors along the, the chain of value of the yachting industry to uh, move in that direction. Maybe, maybe two figures I would like to mention. Um, so the green, green gas, uh, the green, uh, greenhouse gas emission, uh, for the shipping industry, including yachting, represent 2 and 3% of the total, total emission uh, worldwide. Uh, it's, it's very small, but it's already too much. That is to say that if you compare and if you include carbon plus NOx plus SOx, it represents the total emission of the, the annual emission of Germany just to give you also some, 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 some figures. That is to say that this industry is uh, has to move fast in the right uh, direction. And, uh, and how we respond to this challenge uh, will be key to the success uh, and the longevity of this uh, industry, including, including uh, maritime bankers, uh, I, I would say. So, Definitely for banks, uh, we have to, to go further the Poiseuillon principle. So one of the key achievements is now to assess um, the carbon print of our loan portfolio. So that's, that's a good step. So we need to have the figures, the right figures, in order to assess the carbon print of our portfolio. But it's not enough. We have to move 
altogether uh, uh, fast and uh, in the right in the right direction. Otherwise, uh, otherwise we'll uh, we'll have uh, altogether hard time uh, under under the spotlight. That's for sure. And there are transparency obligations, aren't they? So the, so you have to publish those uh, that information. <laughs> Anthony, this is an, uh, something that's affecting. Uh, your approach as well to, to yacht lending? It, it, is, it is starting, yeah. Um, uh, Olivier summarized the situation perfectly. I think that um, uh, we have to go through this step. Um, we, uh, as part of big groups, we, have, uh, we are already challenged by the, by the public opinion, by the regulators, by the, the shareholders. Um, on the corporate and investment banking activities, so there is less and less um, deals which are being made on um, um, on 100% car carbon uh, electricity or energy, uh, um, um, you know, pro provided provided uh, provided assets or, or structures. So um, it's coming to us. The, the shipping industry has, has taking it forward, and it's coming to us. And as I said, Olivier, we we will need a, at a certain point, and in probably in, in in, in very, very uh, 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 nearly, nearly days uh, to sit down with the industry and to see how we, can, how we can put that together. Because as of today, we don't have any data, we don't have any things to, to, to move forward on that from a banking perspective. And on our side, there is a point where we will not be able to, to, to postpone this. Once this will be asked uh, internally by the shareholders, by, uh, you know, it's, it's just look around you. Today, everybody is, is concerned about, about that. Um, so, as said Olivier, we, we are financing assets which, has, uh, which are at the top of the iceberg and in, on the spotlight. So, we have to go this step and, and I think 2020 will be, will be key for that and, and, and the next year as well. I think, Jim, you were saying earlier that to the extent that you're doing refit, ref, refinancing, this is, a, this is a big issue as well in terms of, of engine emissions and so on. Yeah, one of the markets that we really like is the refit market. You've got a lot of Big boats were our need of upgrades and refits, and this certainly plays right into it to make it as most efficient and clean and green as possible. So we're in the middle of three or four deals right now where boats are being refit, re-engined, new systems, cut open. It's sort of a, it's a scary process for the uneducated when they look at this thing and they see holes in the boat. Uh, the chairman of the bank asks me every so often how many holes are in this boat right now. And you know, I show him the pictures and he goes, I just don't want to see it anymore. Um, but it really depends on the yard doing it. Uh, and so, we, again, we become a partner with the owner of the boat, especially in the refit process, and the whole team around him. And then we get into flagging issues when they refit, especially if they want to charter. And we get asked about all different types of flagging countries, and it's like, no, 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 no. We'll take this one and this one and this one, and that's it. Uh, so it's, again, it, it, like you say, it's a very complex business. You got to stay with it, and you got to stay just involved all the way through. But maybe if I can add uh, one thing. It is a complex business, but, and at the same time, it is a very whole business. And uh, I well remember that two years back, uh, I spent one week in, in Italy uh, to, to discuss uh, with all the shipyards uh, the need to change, the need to transform themselves. Uh, and, and as I said, uh, all the banks are ready to, to give them some flexibility. Uh, the corporate bank, uh, if they are able to transform their own uh, model. If you look at the, the engines, if you look at the, the fuel efficiency, uh, it's, it's a very old, uh, old industry, so coming from the, 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 the 19th century. So if you discuss with people from Caterpillar or MTU, I don't know if we have some Caterpillar and MTU uh, in the room, but please react. In terms of technology, it's a very old technology, uh, I would say. So, so where we stand in terms of uh, hydrogen, LPGs, so in, a, in order to reduce, uh, to reduce the gas emission. Uh, in terms of uh, design engineering, where we stand, okay, when you build, do you, do you build your, the yacht by thinking at the, uh, of the, the end of the life of the, the yacht? For just to give you an example, from a banking perspective, from a Ben, ben P. Paribas perspective, uh, and I speak also for myself, we have a big concern with the GRP uh, yacht. What happens with the plastic? At the end, uh, that's a, that's a big concern we were for, for for us to be honest. There was a question. Sorry, uh, Michel. I, I want to pick up, go back to one of the questions we had just now. 
Uh, somebody's asked about loan to value. So Andy, in terms of maximum loan to value that you would do on a yacht, a yacht loan? Again, typical banker's answer, it depends. I mean, what value are we talking about? Is it the owner's opinion of value, even though he probably bought it for less than what he says it's worth? Are we talking about an appraised value from, a, you know, from one of the specialist surveyors that we may use? Is it what the broker says it is? I mean, we, there was a, I, th I think a similar question last year, and I think we all agreed that you, that you lend quite conservatively compared to other asset classes. I mean, you might be at 50%, you might be at 60, you might be at, I mean, the lower, the larger the yacht, I would suggest the lower the LTV. Mm. Um, so if we were financing a, you know, a production or semi-production boat, we're probably gonna be 75% of, of cost. Um, if it's something which is fairly generic or as generic as you can get at that level, um, the higher up the food chain you go and the more bespoke you get, then we're gonna be a lot nearer 50. Um, another, another question, Michelle, about uh, construction risk. How do lenders assess and cope with construction risk? risk? In other words, the risk on the shipyard. Will you, uh, you have certain shipyards that you, will, you are satisfied with or others that you will require reports to be drawn up and you will investigate? Yeah, of course. I mean, when we as a bank finance during construction, we also, we not only have the client's risk, but also the, the performance risk of the shipyard. So, um, so it would not be available for, for any shipyard um, and we would want to have some kind of security or at least certainty that uh, the risk is acceptable. Uh, with some shipyards are quite transparent so we get their financials and we can see what their financial situation is and if we are satisfied then that's fine. Uh, others are more discreet, don't want to share, which is fair enough. So then we will have uh, the request for additional securities typically to be provided by the client during construction. But it really depends from shipyard to shipyard and we have the, the whole, also the documentation quite differs from shipyard to shipyard. Some are more open for construction financing, some don't like it very much and then we have to find a different solution. Anybody else want to add anything to that? Uh, on, uh, on our side, the short answer uh, would be uh, we give a ring to our colleague in Germany or in Italy or in Holland for issuing a refund guarantee in order to protect uh, client and, uh, and ourselves. So that, that's, that would be the, the short answer. Mm. Uh, this looks like a question for you, Andy. How do asset lenders get comfortable with not requiring security of, of assets under management? It's, um, it's all about building the relationship, I think, and it's um, the, the prospective customer will generally appreciate that we need to ask lots of questions um, to really start understanding the relationship, and also to understand that, that the owner and our borrower really understands what they're getting into. So if, if we had a new prospective customer that was clearly very wealthy but had never owned a boat before, we probably wouldn't be very interested unless they were buying a fairly small one. You know, so, but if they'd gone from 20, 30, 40 metres with them buying a 50, then actually they, they, they will probably appreciate the costs involved in actually running them, aside from the finance itself. You know, so it's... It, it's really getting to understand the, the customer's drivers as to why they're doing it. Can they really afford it? There was a great quote earlier about if you can't, you know, if you worry about it, don't buy it. That's probably quite true. We like to lend to money, lend money to people that choose to borrow but don't need to at this sort of higher level above the 40 metre mark, certainly. So it's, you just have to be more diligent. Yeah, I mean, Anthony, for, for, for SOCGEN, the, the assets under, under management are a critical part of the of the uh, of the deal, aren't they for you? The um, uh, it is it is, um, but it, it, it's it, it's part of the of the, the risk analysis. But uh, I think it's more because of the business model we have, um, business model of, of private banking and wealth management. Um, then, of course, uh, to come back to to the loan to value questions that we had before, um, we will focus on on bigger vessel, not not necessarily production boats. So. Um, the loan to value has to be assessed depending also on the size of the of the boat, the liquidities that you have on the market um, and, and different factors uh, such as the pedigree. 
but uh, the, 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 the fact to develop a, a relationship with AUMs is, um, is a positive aspect from a credit analysis perspective. But it's, it's really a key factor um, given, the, given the, the business model. We're not just asset lenders, so um, even if uh, during the credit analysis we do, uh, we do have a lot of comfort on the fact that the client is, is uh, perfectly uh, capable to repay the loan, um, we will still require some, some, some wider relationship uh, by, the, by the asset management. Um, Maybe just to add on, because it, I think it's always a little bit of confusion what, about these private banking requirements that we have. Uh, this is clearly, uh, or the reason why we do that, uh, there are two. One is if we have to assess uh, a client, if he's really able to then repay the loan, uh, including interest, if we see the bankable assets in, our, in the account with us, then we know he has the assets. Otherwise, we get some kind of documentation and we might not be, you know, on, on the latest, you know, information and we do it on a yearly basis, but then time passes. So if we see everything, we feel much more comfortable. That is one. And two is because now with the banking regulation, there is so much regulatory capital which is bound by doing lending for, for yachts that, and it's really limiting our ability to lend to, to other products or to other clients. So then it's clearly that we say, okay, if we lend and if we have that much regulatory capital which is blocked because of this, this lending, we also like to see other business with this client uh, which has no requirement for regulatory capital. So when you have two clients, one has no relationship with us, the other one has a big one, we of course then prefer to lend for the, the client who, who does other business with us. So it's more like a, a business policy and less the security, these assets are not pledged. They, they could also take them away if they wanted. You know, we, we could not, legally, we could not do anything against it. Uh, Jim, you mentioned earlier on the difficulty of, of uh, having value in the uh, yachts as compared to, to, to business jets. Um, who do you, who, whose opinion do you listen to? Is it the, the broker or, or the surveyor that you're talking to? Both. So there's really three values we look at. There's the current fair market value as established by the surveyor, a replacement cost established by the surveyor, and the broker gives me the value of what's it gonna sell for. So that's the one I really care about, because if I have to take a boat back and move it, what am I gonna get for it? And the brokers are really probably the better ones to give us that value. And so we truck with two or three brokers and everything we do on an annual basis about, given this yacht in this condition, what's the, what's the value you could sell this boat for? Anyone else want to comment on valuations? Uh, yeah, so the question is who gives the more realistic valuations, the broker or, or the surveyor? Um, so take the valuation made by the broker or the surveyor, discount by 20, 25%, and maybe you are close to the, the price between a willing buyer and a willing seller. That's the, my short answer. Having said that, it is a complex, uh, a complex thing, uh, and it is true to say that it seems that it's less complex in the private jet, business jet industry, because we have the blue book. At least we have an average price as a starter to, to, discuss, to discuss, which is not the case in this industry. And to be honest, I don't understand why we don't have so far the equivalent of the blue book. I think it could be quite easy to, to, to do. Even if we, we put the, the, the asking price or something in between the asking price and the deal-making price. Um, but, uh, but what we are doing on our side is, to be honest, is to, to, take, uh, to take some, some valuations and also the way you perform your valuation is completely different because either you have what we call a soft valuation, you give a ring to the broker, to the surveyor, okay, I need to uh, please give me a valuation. So based on technical specification, you have a value, but you have a disclaimer of uh, 25 lines. Basically, you have nothing. So if you want to make a real valuation, please go on the yacht, make a sea trial, uh, including a dry dock, exactly as you are doing when you want to buy a yacht. That's the right way to, to have the proper valuations. That's my, uh, my opinion. I think they're both important. I mean, you know, as was alluded to earlier, because they, the valuations are for different purposes. So the, 
the, the bank needs to look at if we had it back and it's never going to be in the condition that you'd like it to be, what are we going to get for it as a bank selling a distressed asset compared to if, if, if the customer is still engaged, as you hope they would be, especially if they have a guarantee on the table, if they were selling it, what would they get for it? So f from a pure risk perspective, you have to look at the worst case scenario, but, but you have to take a steer from the higher one as well, because hopefully that's what it's going to trade out at. Mm. Uh, so there's a few questions that have been hanging around for a while, so maybe we'll qu try and deal with those in the few minutes that are, that are left. Um, how would you manage a similar situation to 2008, where almost all your financing died overnight? Um, anybody volunteer to pick that one up? I'll give a little plug for Close Brothers, if I may, at that point. So um, we are very consistent in how we fund what we fund. We are the only UK funder that's consistently, led, uh, consistently lent in aviation for 42 years and marine, I think, for 22. So we, you know, we, we don't jump in and out of markets just because you know, the market's getting away from us, but we'll perhaps be more conservative than some, but, we're, but as of so far, we've always been there. But Jim, presumably it's a big problem if you've got a lot of um, distressed assets lying around and, and uh, no market for them. Yeah, I mean, that's always a concern. I mean, that's, you know, so uh, I go back to the question. You hope people have learned from 2008 not to leverage everything up, mm. you know. Back to our big real estate clients, a lot of them are very disciplined, and they only put 50% leverage on properties that produce income. And they like to go higher loan-to-values on the depreciating assets. But we look at their cash flow. And... The real estate people are always refinancing properties and doing this and doing that. And most of the ones we have are they develop the properties and they hold them. They don't sell them. So they have this great cash flow. Uh, and again, if, when 2000, if a 2008 scenario came, um, I think the clients that we have will have the cash flow to pay for everything they, they have to be committed to. I, I think we would see a real slowdown in new builds. We'd see a slowdown in trading of a previously owned boats. Um, but I, I hope that we'd be okay, and I hope you know, all of us up here have learned some lessons since 2008 too. Yeah, and in terms of the previous questions that we had uh, just now, uh, there was a question about club deals. Does anybody want to talk about how banks go about sharing the client on club deals? Well, um, share the client. Uh, I don't know if I will take the, the head or the foot. I don't. I don't know. But uh, to be honest, what I share is first of all is a is a transaction, um, and I tend to believe that from balance sheet perspective, especially when you when you are decided to finance uh, a super yacht let's say above 100, 130 centimeters, it could make sense to, 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 to arrange a club, uh, uh, a club deal because you share the risk if something goes wrong, that's, that's for sure. And I tend to believe that with uh, two pairs of highs, uh, we are maybe a bit, uh, a bit stronger. Uh, and, uh, and for us, uh, we are more open uh, uh, to this type of, uh, of of transaction, but obviously it depends also the, the the client. And again, we come back to the initial question: Why on earth the client needs some money to finance a negative cash flow asset? He will be very happy to pay some interest. So we need to understand the story and which type of trade-off he will do between the cost of the money he will borrow from the bank versus the cash he has, he should have in, in hand in his, in his own business. This is the story we, we need to understand and then we'll come back to, uh, to the way to structure the deal with the other bank. Yeah, we won't do a club deal. I'll limit our, our exposure on any particular boat to about 50 million US. And that's at a loan to value between 50, 60, 65, maybe 70. But we keep everything on the balance sheet. We don't syndicate anything. <laughs> Because when you have to go in and operate on these things and reopen the loans, if you've got someone else invested with you, it becomes a mess. So we've just decided we're going to keep it simple. We're going to be the, the sole supplier of the funds, and we, we won't sell anything. We'll just keep it so we can go in and reopen. Okay, so I'm going to ask one final question. I'm going to ask each of you in turn, which is, what, what do you see um, happening in the next 12 months in the, in the yacht finance 
either uh, as a bank or, or generally? Um, anything in particular that you, you're expecting to, to see when he changes? Um, whoever wants to answer first, um, pick it up. I'll go first. Um, well, this year's looking very positive for us, and it's, it's almost as if as soon as the UK general election was out of the way, then a direction of travel was established and customers have been committing. So lots of existing or potential customers that we were talking to throughout 18 and 19 have actually committed to do stuff. So, that, so for us, it's looking certainly more positive than last year. So that you see that as a sort of Brexit um, certainty type of, uh, of, of bounce? I think, I, I think it was the fact that there was a decision as opposed to what the decision was. Because yeah. as, as long as you know where you're going, you can structure it accordingly. Jim, on a similar line in terms of the US, there was a question earlier on. Um, in terms of the US elections coming up, is that something that will affect your business in the next 12 months? Uh, yes, yes and no. I mean, who knows? I mean, if we have a shift in the administration and this, the current tax bill we operate under is changed, it may turn everything upside down. Yeah. I think, you know, I, who knows who's going to win an election and who's going to run and what's available to us to pick from. Uh, I think we sort of look at it like we're good for this year, we think, and we'll take next year at next year's pace and see what goes mm -hmm. on. Um, the U.S. economy is doing very well. Um, and it's not related to one president, it's related to many administrations, so it's a trend. Uh, so I guess we just have to wait and see, but for now it seems okay. And Michelle, do you expect to, to, to lend uh, uh, more yachts next year than, than this year, or, or fewer? Um, I, think, I think it's... Uh... Thank you. I would think uh, this year is, is about going to be as, as last year, and last year was a, a very good year, I would say. Um, we do always a certain number of, of refinancing, so equity releases, so people who paid cash the year before or two years before, so those people are a little bit less affected by, by decisions not to buy or to buy a new one. So I think this business will be stable, and we, we still have requests now pending for, for construction financings, so I'm rather optimistic for at least this year, but of course, uh, one never knows. Anthony, any reason why you shouldn't be doing more business next year than, than last year? <laughs> just coming back to your, last, to your previous question, just hope that nothing like 2008 will happen, that's it. <laughs> Um, no, we, we, yeah, we're quite confident. Um, Brexit, Brexit is, is happening, um, US elections, but we, we've had like three, four last years of, uh, you know, up and down in politics and we saw that the economy um, uh, has, has, has been reacting not as we, as we were expecting. So the, the, the shipyards order book, uh, at least in Europe, are quite, quite consistent, quite good. Um, we'll see the, the second-hand market. The season is nearly starting. Um, so we'll see, we'll see in, the, in the coming months if the, the second market is quite, uh, quite active as, as it has been over the last two to three years. Yeah. Olivier, any thoughts on that, on the next 12 months? I think, I think the, the market is, uh, is changing. Our clients also uh, are changing a bit, uh, where we, we can see kind of uh, uberization of the market, that is to say that to enjoy your yacht, that's for sure, they will continue to enjoy your yacht, but the way they, they enjoy the yacht will change dramatically in the next uh, coming months and, and years, especially with the young generation. On our own business, uh, I cannot complain, last year we, we did a very good year. Uh, I will be more than happy to uh, replicate, uh, replicate what we have done last year. Um, but as I, as I said, there's some clouds here and there from a regulation perspective, from a sanction perspective, from a compliance perspective, and uh, uh, also um, from a market perspective, because when we, because we mentioned, okay, the, the order book uh, are pretty solid, uh, but what we understand also, there are also a lot of uh, constructions these days without uh, owner behind. So we will see also what happens. Uh, I think we, we have to, to, to be cautious for the next 12 months. Thank you all very much. Very interesting panel. Thank you. Thank you.